training Sunday school teachers for a little bit time, teaching in Bible colleges, but my sheer joy every day was witnessing to Muslim taxi drivers because I'd be in a taxi for five hours a day, no exaggeration. So I always had lots and lots of Muslim taxi drivers to share with, and um, I wasn't going to send um, share any of those test messages, I think we don't have time, but I just want to share a few um, principles. Usually, the la- on, inv- on evangelism, because usually the last thing a person says if they're dying, you know, to a, a de- on their deathbed, they usually have the most important thing they want to communicate to their family. And the last thing that Jesus said was, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, which makes it pretty important. Mm-hmm. The last thing he communicated to us, and that's the great commission that Jesus left us. And um, it's a joy. I don't know why people kind of don't want to hear about evangelism, because it's a sheer joy. And if you love people, you're going to just automatically be an evangelist. I can't think of any other explanation. If you love people and you love God, you can't help but want to share. And if every person, if every Christian did this um, daily, with everyone we meet, then the world would be very quickly saved. I mean, we could be planning on being out here by the end of the year if we all did it. Because we all rub shoulders with so many people. Even on the train today, I got the wrong train. <laughs> There's a fast one and a slow one. And I was so worried about being late. But I got to give my, my track to two people today on the train and to talk to one guy for quite a lot of while. But the reason is I was sharing with Pastor Paul that we often don't share the gospel is fear of man. And um, the second reason is we simply don't know what to say. Is that not true? Mm-hmm. You're sitting there on the train or the bus or you're with someone and you think, oh, what do I say? We don't know what to say. And um, we obviously don't just plunge in with, listen, mate, you're a sinner and you're going to hell. We don't do that. <laughs> the first thing God wants us to do as Christians is just be friendly. Just be friendly. Um, and all you have to do is simply start talking. Now, for me, you probably, some people say, oh, Susie, you even think out loud. <laughs> I talk a lot. I always spend a lot of my school life in the, in the corridor, being seen down the corridor because I was talking. But um, <laughs> just start talking. And that is the rule of evangelism. And that's really all I want you to go away with today is start talking. And strike up a conversation with the person next to you. And when you're thinking, I don't know what to say, do you know, I found specifically while I've been in England, um, I came in 2016, so, and I've been twice before that for short visits. But God started doing something quite different. He'd give me what to say to the person, and I'd argue with him. I'd say, no, that's too corny. No way am I saying that. <laughs> but when I obeyed, every time it led to a conversation that led to the gospel. So I really had to start obeying what he showed me. Back in Indonesia, often with Muslim taxi drivers, he would give me words of knowledge, and that was great, but that's not what he's been doing here. <laughs> he's just been giving me the opening sentence, and I go with it, and next minute we're in a, in a really good conversation. So he, and I think my greatest asset is the track, because I've always got that with me, and sometimes, you know, you're on the train, and today I had a really brief encounter with a girl with red hair, and um, I knew God was saying, give her your track, and then I realized, oh no, it's Victoria, I had to get off. So I jumped off, and then the train just sat there. It just sat there, and sat there, and sat there, and it was like God said, I told you to give it to that girl with red hair. And and I thought, well, that train doesn't usually just sit there, I don't want to get on and then not get here. And um, then it just sat there, so I I quickly grabbed one out of my bag, rushed back to the train, asked the girl at the door to give it to the girl with red hair, and she waved to me, because we'd already been talking. And oh, it's amazing, isn't it? He really wanted that girl with red hair to have a track today. So, um, yeah, I'm going to give them to you. And when I do off that track, I just say, um, this is something that I wrote myself for people in England. And since they're in England, they're eligible, aren't they? <laughs> so I just say that, and you know, very, very, very rarely have I ever had someone say, no, thank you. And even often when they do say no, thank you, I keep talking and often change their mind. And by the time I finish talking, they say, yes, I will take it. So it's really, really neat. And um, I just love it when people, like, I was missionary to Muslim, so I kind of hunt down Muslims. <laughs> and I remember giving it to one young Muslim man, and he read it, and then he said, can I keep it? And I said, yes, and he said, I'm really interested in this. And then another Muslim girl that was in full garb, I gave it to her, and she read it, and then she said to me, this is beautiful. Oh, praise God. It, it makes it so worth it, you know. Don't hesitate. 
don't think, oh, that person's not interested because who's whispering back to you? You know, whose voice is that? So the thing is to be led of the Lord and I'll go on the train, you'll even direct me to someone who's way down the far end of the, tr- the carriage. I have to get up and walk down the carriage and give it to that particular person and then start chatting with them. One occasion I offered it to a man just across from me and he said, no, thank you. But the lady next to him said, I'd like it. So she read it and then she said, this is just what I needed. And actually that particular day, I think I had talked about 13 people. And God just kept doing two trains stop because of the electrical problems. One, the whole carriage went black and I was able to preach to the whole carriage while it was in the darkness. And then when the light came on, just a couple of people wanted the But still, two people. And they wanted it. Um... So, where are we? So, I've, over these tracks, I've probably printed about 5,000 already. And one time, I was, um, I didn't have any money. And I thought, I really am running out of tracks. I need some more. So, I went up to that office place. I'll never go there again. It's too expensive. I found a really good place. But I went up there, and I wanted to order 300. And I really didn't have enough money. I had about half of what I needed. But I went anyway, just trusting God. And as I'm waiting in the printing shop, I gave it to one of the customers who was also waiting. And he read it, and then he said to me, how much is this going to cost you? And I told him, 35 pounds. And he said, okay, I'll pay it. I just thought, would you just amazing? Because I had 15 pounds. So it was just, that's what God's like, you know? He just doubled what I could get. Um, so... I've got notes only because I've got so much to say that I'll get sidetracked. So rule number one, everyone, is just start talking. Start talking to the person. People really want to be talked to. This is a really lonely place. I can't get over in London. It's not like New Zealand where we do talk to each other. I talk to anyone I sit next to on the bus and they would talk to me. But here in London, it's rare, isn't it? To talk to people. They're just... I know. It's a really really unfriendly city. London is a very... But I also went to the the protest yesterday and spent an hour and a half talking to two men who took the track. So that was really neat. And I talked to some policemen, but that's another story. So um, often here in London, I find that God, as I said, He gives me the opening of the conversation. And um, one time I was... I'll just give you one example because I've got hundreds. One time I was on the bus, it was late at night, I was going from Elephant Elephant and Castle to New is it Newgate or I'm I'm not sure, but I know where I got off. And um, the lady sitting next to me was on her device, as people usually are. That brought something else to my mind. As people usually are, and it popped into my head to say to her, Would you really prefer to be on your device than talk to the person next to you? And um, then she responded and she said, No, and she put it away and she said, I'd much rather talk to someone. So we talked then for a good 25 minutes and we actually got off at the same stop. And by that time it was about 11 and I had to walk to a really dark place and it was near council flat and it was it was really quite scary. But I wasn't scared because of God, you know. It's like, um, I always think in Indonesia when I had to go through very dark alleys late at night, that why waste angels? It's like noon day to God, isn't it? It's the mm. same as noon day. So I'm not frightened, but I, would, I think she was very grateful to have my company. And... Um, then she, as we parted, she asked for a second track to give to her husband. So I just think, now, God gave me that we opener. And he will give you the openings. And I find that Jesus, as he, he used really everyday objects, didn't he, to teach lessons, like the sparrow. I don't know if a few people are aware of it. But do you know the sparrow is uniquely the only bird in the world that's in every country? And that was the bird that Jesus chose to talk about. I just love that. No matter what country you go to in the world, there's a sparrow. And God said that every sparrow that falls, Jesus knows. Anyway, I was, um, yeah, so he would use things around him to illustrate his point. And I was walking along. Um, I was walking actually past a church graveyard, and a man was mowing the lawn there. And I started witnessing to him, and the Lord directed my attention to the crosses on the tombstones. And um, I'm glad we've got one in this room, actually. And he just, the Lord just gave me the illustration for him that the cross is actually the gospel. And you know how people are often wearing it as jewelry? You can say to them, you know, does, is, that, is that cross meaningful? Is it just jewelry? And, that, and if it's the latter, if it's just jewelry, then you've got an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Because the vertical is, you're either going up to heaven 
and it's a smaller number than us. And the nuns like to be a number that are going to hell because of what Broadway to hell is greater. And then on the either side, on your, your horizontal crossbar, you've really got the choice. It's your choice, yes or no, like the two thieves, either side of Jesus. You're going to say yes to him and go up, or no to him and go down. You know, it's a very simple gospel illustration that we've got on the cross. So, um, yeah. But as Pastor Paul mentioned, the fear of man is the snare, isn't it? It is a snare. And um, as he, he mentioned, I, I talked about the um, fear of man preventing us and the spirit of fear of man being over England. Well, in 1980, I first went to Indonesia. And um, I can remember I'd just read Derek Prince's book, um, Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting. And I asked God, what's the spirit over Indonesia? And he said, deception, which actually proved for 15 years to be so true. My goodness, if you accused anyone of lying, that was it. They went ballistic. Because, and, and under Islam in Indonesia, um, one good work cancels out 15 lies. So lying, corruption is, is probably one of the most corrupt countries. I think Philip, the Philippines might be a contender as well. Um, so I asked the Lord, what was the spirit over England? And I asked that the second time I came to England. And he just said the fear of man. And it's really true. And I even found myself coming under it. Like I'd be in a, the big lift at Elephant and Castle and I'd want to preach to everyone or just say something and I'd just sit there. I thought, Lord, what's happening to me? And the same, I wanted to talk to a whole carriage. Well, God organized that one day. But I, I really found that I was also being intimidated. It's a spirit. And you need to take authority over that. Say, I bind that spirit. I take authority over it in Jesus' name. I will not have the spirit of fear. God has not given me a spirit of fear. And you'll find it goes. And I've always wanted to... Um, speak to people when the lift is full of people or a full carriage or when everyone's at the bus stop and I just have to fight down that intimidation and then I just say in a loud voice um, would anyone like to read something that I wrote about how much God loves you and what he's done for you and always about two or three out of a crowd of a bay of seven or eight will say yes isn't that great mm -hmm. I mean it's worth it that's, that's quite a good percentage so um yeah, and I'm, then I'm so glad I did it. So it's really, you've got to take the ball by the horns and really just do it. Because Satan's the only one closing you down. If you know he's the one closing you down, then that makes me even more determined that he's not going to close me down. Um, yeah. So back in... I'm nearly done. <laughs> I'm trying to go so fast. Um, back in 2017, when I attended the bridge, that's Tony Pierce's church, and that's in... Temple Fortune near Golders Green. I was in Hampstead at the time. I used to go out with a group every Friday lunchtime for an hour at Golders Green. I always used to think, an hour? <laughs> yeah, an hour. But anyway, I positioned myself at a particularly busy um, bus stop where we had buses coming in from three directions just over from the station. So there were buses always coming every few minutes. And within the hour, I would get out a whole packet of 100 tracks and what I would simply do was hand the track to people, stand right by the door of the bus, and I'd give it to them as they're getting on the bus, and I'd just say, something to read on the bus, something to read on the bus, something to read on the bus. Occasionally someone would say, what is it? I'd say, read it and find out, and keep on to find out. <laughs> you know, don't give people an opportunity to say no. Mm -hmm. I had friends there who would stand there with a new te with New Testament and say, would you like one? Would you like one? People were just walking past them all the time, and no one was taking them. You know, advertisers know not to do that. They don't stand in the supermarket and say, would you like one? They just say, would you like to try the refund or that? Would you like this or that? They don't give you an opportunity to say no. And we've got to be really careful that we don't as well. It's um, One time I was giving out um, a DVD on against abortion at the University of New Zealand. And I had this young boy with me, and he wasn't getting getting anyone to take them. And I said, don't even ask people. Make a statement. Say, hey guys, something to watch on Friday night. Just always make a statement if everyone took them. We were actually using a baby trolley to fill them up with DVDs and we had to go back to the house three times to fill it up again. So it was just the whole, everyone took one. I don't think anyone said no. And that was because we didn't ask. You know, we made a statement and um, something that, you know, saying, hey, you'll love, you'll love this. You're going to love this, guys. Hey, here's a freebie. Here's a freebie. And we just, all the students just took it, you know, <laughs> because who's going to say no for a freebie? <laughs> so it's just a matter of how we approach people. Um, 
So, where am I to? Now, when I was living in Indonesia for 15 years, I daily been in Texas, as I mentioned, and um, so I was constantly witnessing. It was also good language practice for me because I was an Indonesian speaking Indonesian. And God really spoke to me one day, and He said to me, Suzette, it's just like learning, learning to play the piano. The more you witness, the better you'll get. I mean, that's any skill, isn't it? The more you practice, the better you get it. And so, um, I want to just, I really want to leave you with the injunction of starting, start talking wherever you are and to hit whoever um, is close to you and expect God to give you the opening gambit. Um, gosh, I can, I can remember when I first started teaching high school back in 1973, I can remember um, God saying to me, I want you to, I want you to praise, say something encouraging to every child. And I had over 125 in a week. Every child says something encouraging each week. To each child. I mean, some children, some boys particularly, I've heard say, gosh, your shoes are quite clean today. <laughs> it was really hard to say something good to some of those jokes. But, you know, it's, being, it's actually just being positive. He can give you something to say. You can comment on their baby. You can comment on their jewelry. Comment on their bed. Comment on their hairstyle. Anything to start the conversation. Because once it started, and actually, because I do think out loud, sometimes one day I was just thinking, how come that train can come up here because that track just doesn't even come this way? And the girl said, I was thinking the same thing. So just, you know, and then we got in a conversation, and we were in conversation for a long time because I was going from Burnt Oak to Kennington. It's a long way. And um, God just put you with the right person, and I don't know how he does it. But even yesterday, when we talked to these two guys, William and Paul, actually his name was, he said, Paul. What's your name? Paul. <laughs> Um, I just left them because they were both not convinced. Um, one had been, well, both of them really had been inoculated by being in the Church of England and schools where they've had a bit of Christianity, which inoculates you if you don't actually respond. So I just shared with them, and this is what I share with a lot of people. It wouldn't matter if you're Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, humanist, whatever you are. I say, how many fingers have you got? And they look at their hand, amazingly. <laughs> They know, like they look at their hand, and I say, well, you're going to pray this prayer tonight when your head hits the pillow. Your thumb is God, and your four fingers are God, show <coughs> me the truth. It works in French, too. I was in France for a whole year, a year ago. Show me the truth. And then I get them to say it quite a few times. What are you going to say? God, show me the truth. What are you going to say? God, show me the truth. And I say, when your head hits the pillow tonight, if you haven't already done it, you're going to pray that prayer because that's like... Playing tennis with God, you're putting the ball in his court, and how he hits it back is up to him. Sometimes that gives me an opportunity to share how I got saved at 22 through an open, I was, my eyes were open and God gave me a vision and spoke to me and played back a prayer I prayed when I was 12. So that's how I got saved. So, um, just, you know, how God will respond when they pray that prayer is totally up to God. You know, we never know what God's going to do. And he did, no two people in this room have had the same testimony. None of us. And no two Christians in the world have got the same testimony of how they came to know the Lord. So, so get them to say, God, show me the truth. Most people are prepared to do that, you know. Even atheists have said, all right, I've got nothing to lose. I said, no, you've got nothing to lose. Everything to gain. And if nothing happens, you've lost nothing. But if something does, it's really exciting wondering, what is God going to do? And I say, God, show me the truth. Because he's been waiting your whole life to hear you ask him that, mm. and he will show you the truth. Mm. So, um, I just was going to share one other thing here. I just was recording, I just drove this down, just on the train actually. I can remember I was walking down the street in Hampstead with this really, she was in her 90s, and I was witnessing to her, and I walked away from Hampstead Heath back to where I was living, and um, she just wasn't open. She wasn't open, and she wasn't going to accept Jesus. And um, I remember something God had said to me once in Indonesia. He said to me, Suzette, regret is the emotion of hell. Regret is the emotion of hell. People in hell. So I reminded, I said to her, do you know, if you, if you die, and she was getting on, if you die without accepting Jesus, you're going to spend eternity remembering this conversation as we walked along this pavement and wishing, regretting, that you didn't accept Jesus. So, you know, that, that will be it. And... You'll just be longing for just 30 seconds back on earth to make a different decision if you could only have it, but you won't get it. So we really need to, to be strong with people to let them know that, you know, none of us know when we're going to die. 
In New Zealand, we had that earthquake where 183 people died just at the end of their lunchtime. They, no one was thinking anything was going to happen to them that day, apart from all the people who got injured. So we don't know how long we've got, do we? And so it's a question, God says, now is the day of salvation. And so we really need to stress that point that you don't know how long you've got. None of us do. And to find yourself in hell with no way out, no way back, and no just regretting that you didn't accept Jesus when he was offered to you, and it's a free gift. He's not asking anything of you except to accept something he's done for you. So amazing. You have to read the track to know what he's done for you. Okay, and I'm going to leave it there. So um, I hope I hope that you'll all just remember to start talking. That's my message today. Just start talking. Most of my family would message to me is stop talking, Suzette. But for you, it's start talking. Okay, thanks a lot. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you're just wonderful and you know there's great joy in sharing the gospel and Father, we just ask today that every single one of us, you're going to give us just those openings all the time and you're going to fill our heart with such a love that that love for other people will over um, overcome any fear we might have of speaking to them. And so Lord, I just really pray that you help us and that we'll take every opportunity, every opportunity to share with the person who's in our vicinity or close to us in any way at all. And Lord Jesus, you once said to me that um, prayer, prayer was striking the prayer was striking, striking the winning blow and that service was gathering up the results and that you really want us to pray that their hard heart will be softened so that when we throw that seed out, it will go into their heart. So Lord, we do pray that all the people we meet, you are going ahead of us and softening their hearts so that the seed of the gospel will go into that heart and will grow and bring forth fruit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.